Good day. As long as I've been an FPV pilot, I've flown nothing but Betaflight firmware. Today, that's going to change. Based on some feedback I got from you guys, when asked if you were interested in seeing an INAV build, I'm going to put INAV firmware on a quad, specifically my triple stack 3-inch Nexus build, to see what it can do. I'll go over the similarities and differences between Betaflight and INAV, take a look at some of the INAV hardware requirements, then we'll dive into the INAV configurator from downloading it to the complete INAV configurator setup going through the INAV configurator tabs. We'll finish up with a test flight of our new Nexus INAV build to check out both the INAV position hold and return to home capabilities. That's right, from firmware flash to flight, this is your complete INAV setup video. For your convenience, there's hyperlinked video chapters in the video description below, so you can jump to any of the sections of the video you're interested in just by clicking on the timestamp next to it. That makes it easy to watch just part of the video now and come back later to pick up where you left off at any time. If you find this video useful, make sure to give it a thumbs up, comment below with your INAV experiences and thoughts for future videos, and subscribe to your TMAC FPV channel. Your home for your journey to better FPV fun, flights, and racing stuff. INAV is firmware for your flight controller just as Betaflight is firmware for your flight controller. In fact, similar to Betaflight's Betaflight configurator, INAV has its own INAV configurator. The main general difference between INAV firmware and Betaflight firmware is that INAV has a heavy focus upon GPS features such as return to home, whereas Betaflight has GPS rescue only. With INAV, you can do position hold of your multi-rotor, and you can even add waypoints using the GPS feature in INAV to map out a specific flight pattern for that particular mission with its mission planning features. In general, INAV gives you a different set of flight parameters and features than Betaflight, which might be fun to try out. Before we get started, there are a few things we need to consider. INAV doesn't support all of the same flight controllers that Betaflight does. In fact, INAV either needs a flight controller with a barometer, or I believe you should be able to use an externally installed barometer as well. For a list of INAV supported flight controllers, check out this INAV site, Supported Boards, which I'll link to in the video description below. Of course, you'll want to read these absolutely mandatory pages to read. And since I'm already familiar with using the Betaflight configurator and firmware, I'm going to go to this INAV site, INAV for Betaflight users, and follow the steps outlined in this page for my initial setup. The top portion of the page discusses, in general terms, the differences between INAV and Betaflight, while below it, these bullet statements cover some of the specific differences between INAV and Betaflight, such as not all flight controller boards have a proper target for INAV, which I mentioned previously. The flight controller I'll be using is this Maytech F722 Mini SE, which I've got in the center stack position of my triple stack 3-inch Nexus build. You can check out this Nexus frame if you want on my site at tmacfpv.com slash Nexus. INAV also obviously needs a GPS module, but not just any module like this SAM M8Q I'm accustomed to using but one with a compass. The smallest and lightest weight GPS module I could find with a compass is this Maytec M8Q5883. Those are basically the two things you need to know about the hardware required to take full advantage of INAV that I'm currently aware of. You need a barometer, and I'll be using the Maytec F722 Mini SE with a barometer, and a GPS with a compass like this Maytec M8Q5883. So I'm going to remove this SAM M8Q from the Nexus build and wire up this new Maytec M8Q5883 with a compass to my F722 Mini SE. All right, at this point, I've replaced the SAM M8Q GPS module with the Maytec M8Q5883 that has the compass. Pretty much connected it just the same way as the SAM M8Q. You've got the four wires, the power, ground, RX, and TX of the GPS module running to power, ground, RX, and TX of the flight controller. Of course, the RX of the GPS module goes to TX of the flight controller and vice versa for the TX of the GPS module goes to the RX of the flight controller. However, this also has the compass wires, uh, SDA and SCL. SDA is the white wire from the GPS module and SCL is the green wire. Those are going over here to these SDA and SCL pads on the F722 Mini. Now, the power and ground and the 
RX and TX wires of the GPS module. I don't have going directly to the flight controller, just as I did not with the SAM M8Q. Instead, I've got them running to this VFly GPS mate, and you hook the GPS module up to the GPS mate and the GPS mate gets hooked up to the flight controller. What this allows you to do is power the GPS module just by pushing a button without powering on the rest of the quadcopter's electronics, which allows you to get a GPS lock quickly as you see here with the blue light indicator flashing. That's how quickly we can get a GPS lock without the rest of the quadcopter's electronics on it. And what's really cool about this GPS mate also is obviously I don't have a LiPo powered on. So whenever you're flying around and you get done with your flight and you disconnect your LiPo to change out batteries for another flight, this thing stays on and keeps powering your GPS module so you don't have to regain lock every time you replace your LiPo for another flight. The only time this thing gets powered off is when you turn it off. Now the other piece of hardware that's different than Betaflight since we're using the flight controller's barometer, the barometer sensor for this Matek F722 Mini SE is underneath the flight controller just on the other side of this button, this boot button. So it's right around here on the underside. And according to the iNav site, we wanted to cover that a little bit with some non-blocking foam so that any wind passing over it doesn't adversely affect its altitude indications. So I've taken a piece of foam, basically the stuff that you get in, in the box with your motors, and I've taken a piece of this and I've sandwiched it between the flight controller and the base plate. You might be able to see it right there. So that's my quote non-blocking foam covering barometer on my flight controller. Now that we've got the GPS with compass connected properly to the flight controller and our barometer covered with the foam, we're set to go to our next step which is to download and install the iNav Configurator. All right, before we connect our quadcopter to the iNav Configurator and flash it with iNav firmware, I'm going to connect it to Betaflight and save all of the important settings from Betaflight to my hard drive in case for some reason I want or need to revert back to Betaflight on this particular Nexus build. So I'm going to connect Betaflight. And the first thing we're going to do is go to the CLI and type dump all. And the, the current beta flight firmware I have on this flight controller is 4.2.9, dated 27 April 21. So we're going to highlight all of this, all of these beta flight commands, and I'm going to copy them and paste them to a Word document and save it to my Nexus folder. So that all I have to do if I want to revert back to it is copy and paste it back into the CLI, hit return, and then type in save and hit return. So now I've got all of the Betaflight settings saved to my hard drive. Next, what I want to do is take screenshots of the important settings from each of the tabs and save those to the same folder. All right, now that we've captured everything from Betaflight using our dump all command, and screenshots from the various tabs, we're ready to go ahead and connect to our iNav configurator and flash Nexus with the iNav firmware. Okay, once I've got my flight controller with barometer and GPS module with compass properly installed, the first thing I need to do is download the iNav configurator. So I just Google iNav configurator and it's on GitHub, releases, and it says the latest release is 3.0.1. I don't have any older versions of iNav, so I'm gonna start off with 3.0 families, so I should be good to go there. Important notes, anytime they've got a readme document, it's probably a good idea to read it. So on this one, it talks about installation. I've, I'm operating on Windows operating system. It says download the configurator, Win32 or 64. Extract the zip archive and run iNav configurator app from the unpacked folder. And there's a note here that the configurator isn't signed, so we have to allow Windows to run an untrusted application. And there's also instructions for Linux and Mac. I'm going to go ahead and run Win64. Download that over here. Then I'm going to cut and paste it into a folder, which I've already made on my hard drive. I'm going to unzip it. 
going to get rid of the zipped file, open up that folder, and now I can run the inavconfigurator.exe from this folder by double clicking on it, and it brings up the configurator. This is the first time I've seen the INAV configurator page, and it looks similar to the Betaflight configurator, with some important notes over here under hardware and the firmware, and similar type notes on the drivers. Here's also ways that you can contribute to the INAV project. So now we're ready to connect our quad to the INAV configurator. We're ready to open up our INAV configurator and flash our flight controller with INAV firmware. To do that, we go over here to Firmware Flasher and we choose our board. Our flight controller is the Matek F722 Mini SC and our target per the product page is Matek F722 Mini right here. And the firmware version we're gonna select is the latest stable version, which is 3.0.1. At this point, we're gonna load our firmware online and our firmware is now loaded. Now in order to flash the firmware, we're gonna to have to put our flight controller in DFU mode, which means we'll, we should see DFU up here. In order to do that, we need to hold down the boot button on our flight controller, which is right here, while we power up the quadcopter via connection to our computer. Now you see I've got the micro USB cable already connected to the quad, but it's just connected to a USB hub. So it's not powered on yet. All I have to do to power it on is push the button on the USB hub. So I'm gonna press the bootloader button at the same time I power on, and we should go into DFU mode. And you see up here, we now have DFU. So now I'm gonna flash the firmware with full chip erase on. We're erasing and flashing. And our programming has been successful. So now we've got iNav firmware on our Matek F722 Mini SE flight controller, and we're ready to configure it using the iNav configurator. All right, now that we've flashed our firmware to our Nexus build using the iNav configurator, we are ready to connect and start setting it up. So let's go ahead and connect. We're using COM5 and this window pops up and the iNav configurator wants to know what we're flying. So our Nexus build is a micro quadcopter, three inch. So we're gonna click here and it should reboot. It's rebooting and there we go. At this point, we're just gonna go through as quickly as possible the applicable tabs over here on the left. So let's go to calibration. It's a six step calibration it looks like. So we're gonna hit calibrate accelerometer, place the flight controller in position showed in the image, then press calibrate button again, repeat for each of the six positions, keep it stable during calibration. Obviously we've got our quadcopter flat on a flat surface. So we're gonna click okay. And that one's good. And then we need to flip this thing over And then we're going to turn it on its side, like this. And then we're going to point it up, like this. Step five, looks like we are going to point it to the left. We're just following the images in the iNav configurator. And step six, we're going to point it down. And now our calibration is complete after I went back and redid step one with our quadcopter in the flat and level mode. So what we do now is hit save and reboot. And we're ready to move on to our next tab. All right, now we're ready to go to our mixer tab in our iNav configurator. And here, even though previously we chose mini quad three to seven inch props on this page, we have to tell it once again that we're dealing with a 
quadcopter X configuration. Perhaps on the previous selection, instead of mini quad, three to seven inch props, a more appropriate terminology might have been multi rotor, but that's neither here nor there. So we're on the mixer tab, multi rotor, and the reason we need to tell it it's a quadcopter in X configuration is because iNav supports all of these other types of vehicles, such as a hexacopter, octocopter, things of that nature. We're going to deal with quad X, and at this point, all we need to do is load mixer and save and reboot. All right, now we're ready to go to our outputs tab. And here we want to enable the motor and servo output. Our ESC protocol, I'm going to keep mine at DSHOT 600, which is basically what I use for beta flight. My motor's idle power percent, this is too high for what uh, I normally use in beta flight, which is around five and a half. In this case, I'm going to take this down to five. And the number of motor poles or the number of magnets on my iFlight Zing 1404-3000 kV motors is 12. I would imagine this is required for RPM filters if I choose to use those. So I'm going to put in 12. Okay, before we do anything else, I'm going to hit save and reboot. And now we've got DSHOT 600, 5, and 12. Now down here, what we want to do is we want to make sure there's a couple things we actually want to do. First, we want to make sure that the correct motor spins when I raise each one of its levers. So when I raise the lever for motor one, motor one is the correct motor that spins. Same thing for motor two, when I raise the lever for motor two, and so on for three and four. So let's go ahead and take care of that. I understand the risks and props are off and we're going to plug in a LiPo. And I'm going to raise the lever for motor one and hopefully motor one spins. And it does. That's a good thing. Motor two. Good. Motor three. Good. And motor four. Good. All right. Now, let's check the spin direction of these motors. In beta flight, I've been running props out, which means I've actually reversed the motor spins from what they're depicted here. So let's take a look at each one of the motors and see which direction it's currently spinning. I'm just going to rest my finger gently on motor one and see if it spins clockwise or counterclockwise. This is spinning counterclockwise, which is opposite of this diagram. And that's good because that's how I set it up in Betaflight. Let's check motor two. Motor two is spinning clockwise, which is opposite of this diagram. Once again, that's a good thing. Motor three is spinning clockwise, which is opposite of that. That's good. And motor four is spinning counterclockwise, which is opposite of that, which is all good because that's, where, that's what I've set up in beta flight. But we need to tell iNav that we've reversed the motor directions. So in order to do that, once again, I'm going to hit save before I do anything else. I'm going to go to the CLI and we're going to type in set motor underline direction underline inverted equals on. Hit return. Then we're going to type in save and hit return. Then we're going to go back to our CLI and type in get inverted to see if it took. And we see that our motor direction inverted is now on, which means I'm running props out and the motor spin direction has been reversed, which is what I want. That's good. So now we've got our configuration of our motors output set and we verified that the motors that need to spin are the ones that are spinning and that their spin direction is correct. So we're done with the outputs tab on our iNav configurator. All right, now we're moving on to our ports tab and taking a look at our Betaflight settings that we saved earlier for our ports tab. It's pretty much the same thing. On UART1, 
we have our GPS, and because of that, we're not able to have the MSP toggled on here, so we're going to turn that off. We don't want to turn this one off. We want to turn UART1 off. The baud rate is defaulted to 115.200, and if we look at the product page for the Matek M8Q5883, we see that the baud rate can go from 9600 to 11500 supported by those firmwares. So we're going to leave it at 11500 Here, for UART2, that's where we have our serial RX enabled for our receiver. And in UART3, we have VTX IRC Tramp. And then we're going to save and reboot. All right, now we're ready to move on to our configuration tab. And here I want to change my flight controller loop time to 4K, which is what I use in Betaflight. And we have a note here. If you just hover over the question marks, it'll explain a little bit more about the field that you're about to change. And it says observe CPU usage. So when I change this to 4K, I want to look down here to our CPU load. And I'm going to save and reboot so we can check that out. And our CPU load went from 12 to 24, which is still okay. So I'm going to leave it at 4K. Accelerometer is MPU 6000. Magnetometer, yes, we've got one. And that's going to be QMC 5883 on our Matek M8Q 5883. Our barometer on our flight controller is the DPS 310. Don't have a pitot tube or a rangefinder or optical flow on this particular quadcopter. Now, if we go to our product page under the tips section, it says with our GPS arrow facing forward, this arrow, which is currently facing back, it says with this arrow facing forward that we should do the CW270 flip. Since I've got the arrow facing back, that's 180 degrees from facing forward. So I'm going to subtract 180 from 270, and let's see if we've got the option of 90 degrees flip. Right here. That's what I want. We're also going to enable GPS. UBlox is the protocol that we're using. Ground assistance type, I'm going to do North American. And I do want to use GPS Galileo sal satellites when they're available. I'm going to change that to TMAC. FPV Nexus. And here, use low power while the craft is disarmed. It says that I can go ahead and change that to make the VTX use its lowest power while the craft is disarmed or use until first arm to make it use the lowest power only when you arm for the first time. So let's do until first arm. I'm not going to change any of these uh, voltage and current sensors right now. The maximum cell voltage, I'm going to change that to 4.35 because I use HV lipos and I'll keep that at 3.5 and for now I'm going to keep all of these at their defaults so at this point we are done with the configuration tab we're going to hit save and reboot all right now that we've got our configuration set up to include our magnetometer, we can go back to our calibration tab up here and calibrate our compass. Now there's a few things I want to say about this calibration. First of all, there's two different ways to accomplish it. One is through the USB connection to the computer and using this calibration tab. And the second way is by using stick commands out in the field, which is actually the more accurate way to do it. Because when you've got this thing connected to your computer, and you're trying to calibrate it in your home, the magnetometer, which is your compass, is susceptible to electromagnetic interference from your computer and any other electronic or metal devices that it may be around. Therefore, when you do it via the computer, it may not be as accurate as when you do it out in the field with your stick commands. I'm going to demonstrate the first method with it connected to your computer, just for educational purposes, and then I'll also demonstrate how to do it outside with your stick commands. The process that we'll be using to calibrate your compass is described on the GitHub site, on the iNav wiki, under compass calibration. 
and it also includes the compass calibration using your stick functions. So let's go ahead and do the compass calibration with the quadcopter connected to the computer. Basically we've got 30 seconds from the time we click this button to rotate the quad on its pitch axis, on its roll axis, and also on its yaw axis, 360 degrees. Once we've accomplished that within 30 seconds, we can just set the quadcopter back down on a level surface and wait for the timer to count down. Now once again, this is not going to be the most accurate way of accomplishing this because I've got this quadcopter very near the computer, so the values that we come up with may actually be incorrect. We'll go ahead and redo it outside using the stick commands. So to calibrate the compass, we press calibrate compass. Then I'm going to pick it up and we're going to rotate it 360 degrees on the pitch axis, on the yaw axis, and then on the roll axis. And then we're going to set it down and let the rest of the timer count down. And that indicates the calibration was complete. And you see that our numbers have changed up here. We're talking about 0, X, Y, and Z. And it states here that when mag X, Y, and Z parameters are not 0 anymore, then the compass calibration has converged and it's been successful. So we should be good to go with this. And we'll click Save and Reboot. And then we'll redo the calibration outside using the stick commands. Now to perform the compass calibration outside, all we need to do is hold the left stick up and to the right and push the right stick down and the flight controller should beep a couple times indicating start and then we've got 30 seconds to rotate the quadcopter on all three axes. And then when it's done with the 30 seconds, it'll beep once to indicate completion. And then we'll orient the quadcopter facing north to see if it actually gets within five or so degrees of zero degrees or 360 degrees indicating north. That's the start. So I'm going to rotate it on the pitch axis, then the yaw axis. And the roll axis. And we can do it a couple times if we want, if we have time. I'm going to set it down and wait for it to beep once. Now it's done. So to check out whether or not it's been calibrated properly, I'm going to point the quadcopter in the northward direction and we should get somewhere between 350 to 370 degrees or zero degrees plus or minus five to ten degrees somewhere around there that's in the general north direction south would be directly opposite of that so somewhere around there should be around 160 one, I'm, I'm sorry somewhere around there should be around 170 to 190 degrees over here should be between 80 and 100 degrees. And if we point west, in the general west direction, we should get somewhere between 260 and 280. Hopefully that's what you're seeing on the screen. That's how you calibrate it out in the field. Good stuff. All right, the next tab we're going to go to in our iNav configurator is our failsafe tab. Since we've got a GPS with a compass and our flight controller has a barometer, we're going to select our failsafe mode to be return to home. We're going to leave everything else the same. Save and reboot. All right, let's go to our PID tuning tab in our iNav configurator. First of all, before I forget, similar to how I described different PID profiles in this video, Micro FPV Drone Tuning Guide Custom Flight Profiles for Betaflight, iNav has basically the same features for both PID and rate profiles, which you can access from this drop down menu up here in the upper right. We're going to start with Profile 1, and I'm going to walk through this PID tab, then the Mechanics tab, and then the Rates and Expo tab for 
three different profiles. They're all basically going to be the same, but a couple of the values I'm going to tweak just a little bit. Once we're done with the PID gains and the mechanics, the rates and expo for each of these profiles, then we'll go into the filters. The different profiles that you set up are described in the iNav GitHub site, which I'll link below, and you can access using your stick commands. So let's begin with profile one, PID gains. All of our PID gains for all three profiles are gonna be the same. And we can copy those over from Betaflight. Now your control derivative is basically the same thing as feed forward in Betaflight. So I'm gonna put my feed forward numbers from Betaflight in here, which is 109, 116, and 109. And for now, I'm gonna leave all these other numbers as default, and I'm gonna click save before I do anything else. Now your derivative values in Betaflight, you've got the option of D min and D max. However, in iNav, you only see one value here. You've got the same sort of D min and D max uh, options in iNav. However, this one value you see here is the equivalent of D min. If you wanted to add a D max, then you need to go to the mechanics tab and under D term mechanics, this is where the boost factor comes in. This is the multiplying value that you would apply to this D min number. So the default value here, or this value here of 23, if you were to have a D max, go to mechanics tab, you multiply 23 by 1.5, and that comes out to 34.5. So that would be your D max term. However, for my PID profile one in beta flight, I've got these numbers at 38 and 40. And I don't have, I'm not using D min and D max. I'm only using one D term for my PID profile one. So in the mechanics tab, I'm gonna go back over here and make this 1.0, which is gonna be my multiplying value for these numbers, which means if I multiply these numbers by one, they stay the same. Now, in addition on the mechanics tab for your I term mechanics, on my PID profile one, I've got RP for I term relax, your other options are RPY and off. And I do have it set to 15 in beta flight. So that's gonna be it for PID Profile 1. Now let's take a look at our rates in Expo for PID Profile 1. My roll rate for this profile, I've got set at 480 from beta flight, 480 and 275. My roll and pitch exo, expo, I've got set to nine. And my yaw expo, I've got set to two. And we'll click save. And that should do it for profile one. For profile two, the PID values are gonna be the same. So I've inserted those already. And I'm also only using one value for the derivative, but we need to go to the mechanics tab. And remember, because of that, we make that 1.0. And then also my iTerm Relax cutoff frequency for profile two is gonna be 10. So we need to change that and click save and we're good to go. And then let's go to our rates and expo for profile two. My rates for profile two are 613, 613 and 440. And my expo is 10 and 10. I'm gonna click save. So now we're done with profile two. And for profile three, we use the same process. So I've already inserted the same PIDs. Go to our mechanics tab. I've got my multiplier at one and I've changed the iTerm Relax cutoff frequency to five. And these are my rates and expo for profile three. Click save. Now I mentioned you can access these different profiles through those stick commands on the iNav GitHub site. You can also access the different rates by setting them up on your adjustments tab, which we'll go over here shortly. All right, now we're gonna to go to the filters tab within our PID tuning tab of the iNav configurator. And the reason I saved this for last in the PID tuning tab is whereas the PID gains the, and the rates and expo were dependent upon which profile you chose, so they could be different for each profile. The filters are independent of 
the profile you choose and therefore apply to all of the profiles. Now I'm gonna make just a few changes to what I see here. One of the main differences that I've seen so far between iNav filters and Betaflight filters is iNav has less options available to you than Betaflight. And also, as I mentioned, all of the filter settings apply to all of the profiles. What I've done so far is I've made a preliminary comparison of the Betaflight filter settings that I've been using in relationship to these iNav filters. So the changes I'm about to make are based on that. I'm not suggesting that these changes are those that you wanna make on your particular quadcopter. You might just wanna fly with the iNav default settings to begin with. And as you get more experience with the filters specifically for iNav, adjust the settings to your liking. Having said all that, I'm gonna go ahead and make a few changes. First of all, I'm gonna turn this unicorn filter off. I'm gonna take this yaw low pass filter and make that 50. Of note, the RPM filters listed here in iNav are different than those in Betaflight. Because of that and the known differences, I'm gonna leave these off. The D-term filters, I'm gonna leave at their default values. And this matrix filter seems to me to be a series of dynamic notch filters on all three axes. And if you hover over these question marks, it'll give you a brief explanation of what each of these are. Of note, the gyro RPM filters and the unicorn filters don't have such an explanation. So for the matrix filter Q factor, if we look over here, the higher the value, the narrower the matrix filter is, and it suggests values between 150 and 300. I'm gonna keep mine, I'm gonna change mine to 200. And the minimum frequency for the matrix filter, I'm going to reduce that to 100. And those are all the changes I'm gonna make for the filters which apply to all three profiles. I'm gonna click save and we're ready to move on. All right, next we're gonna to go to our receiver tab in our iNav configurator. And as you saw previously on our Nexus build, we do have crossfire set up. So we're gonna choose serial receiver type and our serial receiver provider is going to be crossfire. We're gonna keep everything else the same for now and hit save and reboot. And now we see our crossfire receiver has been saved. And now with our transmitter turned on, we can go ahead and check the various channels, make sure they're working properly, throttle, 1,000 to 2,000, yaw, 1,000, 2,000, pitch, 1,000, that's uh, 1996, that's close, roll. And we can go ahead and adjust the channel endpoints as I described in this video on the Betaflight firmware. All right, now it's time to set up our modes tab in our iNav configurator. And first thing I wanna point out is if you do not have your configuration set up beforehand to include your GPS and your magnetometer, then I believe not all of these options will appear in your modes tab. For instance, things like position hold and return to home may not appear. So you wanna set up your configuration and enable GPS and your magnetometer and barometer and those sorts of things before you enter the modes tab. The other thing I wanted to mention is in the iNav configurator, when you add a range, the difference between iNav and Betaflight is these show as channels, whereas in Betaflight, these show as aux channels. So in Betaflight, channels one through four are your control channels, and aux one is actually channel five. Whereas in iNav, the drop-down menu just starts with channel five. Minor difference, but we're gonna go ahead and set these up. Uh, I'm gonna use channel five or aux one for my arming switch. And then I want to add a range for return to home. And I'm gonna put that on the same switch on my transmitter that I had for GPS rescue. And that's gonna be aux seven in beta flight, which is channel 11. And I'm also gonna put that back down here. At this point in our modes tab, we need to take a break so that I can explain some of the return to home settings. All of the return to home settings can be accessed through this site on the GitHub iNav wiki. 
It explains the various return to home altitudes and modes. And the ones I'll be using is fixed mode, which this diagram explains, and the climb first equals on setting, which is similar to Betaflight's GPS rescue, where the quadcopter turns and climbs and then starts heading back home. Both of those settings can be set in the advanced tuning tab under generic settings, return to home settings, fixed. Here you can set your return to home altitude, the altitude to which it climbs in centimeters. So this would be 50 meters. And climb before return to home can be either on, off, or on with spiral. Once again, those are explained in that GitHub iNav wiki. I'm going to leave this to, I'm going to set this to on. So fixed 5000 and on are the ones I recently changed. It's set to land always after return to home with a minimum return to home distance in centimeters of 500, which is five meters. And once again, if you hold the cursor over each one of these question marks, it'll explain a little bit more about that particular setting. In this case, if the UAV is within this distance, five meters from the home point, it will land instead of return to home and then land. Save and reboot. And then I would like to have position hold, and that's gonna be on channel eight or aux four in Betaflight. And in this case, that's going to be over here. And then I've got my electronics set up on my Nexus build for two cameras. So I want to add a range for camera control one. And that's going to be on channel six, which is aux two in Betaflight. And I'm going to put that down here. Now, we also need a range for camera control two, which is going to be on the same switch of my transmitter. And that's also going to be on channel six. And I'm going to move that over here. Black box, I need to add a range for that. And that's going to be on channel 12. And I've actually put that on my eight buttons up top on my RadioMaster TX16S. And then to coincide with my camera controls up here, I need to add a range for user two. Move that down here. And that's going to be on channel six, the same as camera control one and two. And that should do it. I've got arm, return to home, position hold, camera control, black box, and user two to coincide with the camera control. Now we just save and we're ready to move on. All right, let's go to our adjustments tab. Remember in our PID tuning tab where we set up three different rates, this is where we're going to be able to access them. We do this basically the same way we do in Betaflight. We just enable, I'm going to, I've got three rates, so I'm going to enable these three lines. They're going to be on channel nine. That's the channel I'm using for the switch on my transmitter. We put channel nine there on the left. We put channel nine here on the right. Just as we do in Betaflight. And we select rate profile scroll down rate profile selection do the same thing for the second line and the same thing for the third line by the way i'll just scroll through all of the available adjustments one thing that's missing from this adjustments section in inav that we have in betaflight is an OSD profile selection, and I'll explain that here in just a minute. So to have three different rate profile selections, we just set those up exactly like we do in Betaflight and hit save. As I mentioned, ordinarily, I would put three more lines here for my OSD profile selection, but in iNav, those are taken care of in the modes tab as OSD Alt 1, OSD Alt 2, and OSD Alt 3. And you just set these up just like you would with any of these other modes. When we get to the OSD tab, I'll show you where you can set up OSD Alt 1, 2, and 3 in addition to your default OSD profile. That's it for the adjustments tab. All right, moving on to our OSD tab. Let's go through our, our available options. Battery voltage, yes, and I normally put that down here towards the bottom right of my screen. 
Remaining flight time, that's interesting, but I'm not used to having that, so I'm not going to put that on there. Craft name, yes, I absolutely want that. Up top here. All right, temperature, uh, I don't need temperature, I don't need altitude, I don't need G-force, timers, fly time. I like that down here in the lower left. Basically, what I try to do is keep my OSD screen as clear as possible, but there are some pertinent data points that I like to have on it. None of that for attitude. Current meter, no. Maps and radars, no. VTX, yes, I would like the VTX. And I'm going to put that up here, which is normally where I put it. And I am running crossfire, so I do want receiver link quality upper right. I don't want any of this stuff or that. For now, I'm going to leave all of my alarms as is. I'm going to hit save. Let's take a look at these alternative layouts. As I mentioned, when we we're going through our adjustments tab, you can set up different OSD profiles and access them through a switch on your transmitter by enabling them in the modes tab as OSD Alt 1, OSD Alt 2, and OSD Alt 3. Here's where you do that. This is the default layout that we've added some of our OSD elements to. And you see that here on this preview screen. Now, use the same process for any one of these alternative layouts. For instance, you'll notice on this default screen, I've got the lat and long coordinates from my GPS sensor. For Alt Layout 1, I've not included those in case I want to record the DVR without the lat long coordinates on them. So I go to Alt Layout 1 and I've got different OSD elements. Similarly for Alt Layout 2, I've just got a blank screen. I didn't put any OSD elements on it. So I can, with the flip of a switch on my transmitter, switch between the OSD default layout, Alt Layout 1, and Alt Layout 2, just depending upon what I want to see on my OSD screen for that particular flight. Now there's one other thing in the OSD tab that we need to talk about. We do need to upload a font manager and I'm just going to select the default. And we should be good to go. Okay, now it's time to see if she flies. As with any new setup, first thing I'm going to do is hover for about 30 seconds or so, check out the controls, and I'm going to land and check the motor temps make sure our filters are working properly. Then we'll go somewhere else, check out position home, and return to home. Just joking. They're not even warm. We're good to go. All right, we're gonna test out both position hold and return to home. My position hold switch is this green one. My return to home is this red one. We'll fly around a bit first then I'll activate position hold, and then we'll activate return to home. Pretty windy out today. The wind's buffeting the quadcopter a bit. I 
I know uh, firmware seems to fly pretty well. I like it. All right, let's try position hold. It's fighting the wind. One thing that's cool about this position hold is you can actually modify the hold position with your right stick and then let go. And it, uh, tries to maintain that position. It's fighting it. It's fighting the wind. It's pretty windy out here. Okay, I've regained control. Now we'll go activate return to home. Fighting the wind. Distance to home is reducing. You can see in the uh, OSD, 55 meters. Turn it around. I can hear it. It's right coming down behind me. That's amazing. That was three steps away. All right, I just got back from that flight and I felt like I owed you a better demonstration of the position hold capabilities without the wind than what we just experienced. So. At my house here, my house is surrounded by uh, trees which act like a windbreak. So I'm just going to do a quick position hold flight here at my home and show you what it can really do. Once again, the uh, position hold switch is the green switch on my Radio Master TX16S. a much better job without the wind as you can see well I'm happy with iNav it's a blast I think you'd have fun
Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for your time. I'll see you next video. Clear skies, friend.